welcome to Bitcoin Fixes This, where we explore the impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. Today's guest is Tatiana Moroz, singer, songwriter, and Bitcoiner. We talk about music, the current state of the industry, and how artists make a living. Tatiana also tells us about how she became a singer, what the economic incentives are, and what she'd like to see change. If you've been to any Bitcoin conference with Tatiana, you'd know who she is. She's often seen with her guitar and she can be found singing on stage or in the corner, bringing a lot of energy and making the scene a little more fun. Her analysis of the music industry is frankly pretty depressing. I felt like her view of the world has changed since she got into Bitcoin and her view of music and its power more sober. I hope you enjoy this interview. Tatiana Moroz, how's everything going? Very well, thanks. I'm really happy to see you in person here in Texas. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy everywhere, but where are you flying in from? From New York. Okay, and what's that like these days? Oh, it's like 1984, <laughs> like really, really ramped up. Everybody is wearing masks outside when they're very far from each other. The <laughs> idea of fresh air is completely lost on everyone. Nobody believes in their mouths and their noses anymore. You have to have a mask that has been kept in your pocket mm. rolled up into a little ball because that will keep you safe. Yeah, the lint-laden, <laughs> like, multi-use masks that really don't do very much. Yeah, that's what everyone has to wear these days. How do you think, is Austin any better or is it worse? What's your impression so far? So I was kind of hoping to see a little bit more Texas and a little bit less New York here. And I feel <laughs> like the vibe here is very masky. I don't see any manliness. I was hoping to see a display of testosterone. <laughs> and all I'm seeing is a bunch of soy. That's all I can <laughs> say. <laughs> so not testosterone, but lots and lots of soy. Yeah, exactly. They're wearing fedoras and not actual cowboy hats. Well, to be fair, we are in Austin, and Austin tends to be like the bluest part of Texas. So it kind of makes sense a little bit. I mean, they. I, I'm so frustrated at the amount of restrictions that we have. But good to know we're not the only place, I guess. But not if you're a homeless person. Apparently, there's no restrictions <laughs> there. <laughs> Yeah, you saw all of the tents uh, along. Beautiful the housing that yeah. you've developed right along the highway. Very, very nice. Yeah. Seriously, what's going on? I feel like I'm offended by the homeless people, which is a terrible thing to say because you're supposed to be like, oh, I feel so bad. They're so sad and mm -hmm. their lives are downtrodden. And I guess there's a part of me that feels like that. And I don't know if this is an evolution or like a devolution of character, <laughs> but I'm annoyed that there's that many people. What are you going to do about all this? Yeah, this is much more true in places like L.A. and San Francisco and I imagine New York now. But it's sort of the direction that our country has been going in. So, But what are you going to do with all the poor people? I mean, that's very sad. And it's also kind of like dangerous and sketchy. Mm -hmm. I never felt afraid in New York in my entire life. I grew up in New Jersey, right outside Manhattan. And when I'm in Manhattan, I lock my doors and random people come up to me when I'm not even like at a light where you would normally get the squeegee service, you know, just like random off blocks, like 43rd. And then it's just, it's, it's a little bit scary because they're asking for money. And I don't know, I used to feel very bad and very moved by that. And now I'm just irritated. And I don't think that that's a good evolution of person you know yeah you're That's getting a good. little more callous maybe i don't know i know but <laughs> i mean enough is enough i mean come on it's getting wild out there yeah, what are you going to do with all the homeless people yeah i don't know that's always been sort of the big question is there are always sort of like poor people in society in the past there have been different ways in which they've been able to subsist and so on but right now it's kind of a weird situation i don't know what do you think? What should be done with that? I'm not really sure because I feel like part of it was earlier on, it was people that were being let out of mental institutions. Mm. Now it looks a little bit like a lifestyle choice, <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I mean, the incentive is there to become a homeless person because you get a lot of treats and you have to put up with some bad things, but... I don't know. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to put them all in, in housing and then you're just going to have a really big place that's really filled with poor people that are all on drugs? Mm. I don't know. 
now, actually. I think we're probably going to see a lot more of this. It started out as like a little bit of like a <laughs> shtick comedy. Now it's getting a little bit more depressing. But, I mean, maybe that's what we're going to keep seeing. Do you think we're going to – I mean, obviously, Bitcoin's rallying. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be rich. But what about the rest of these poor slobs that didn't listen to us? What are we going to do? I don't know. It's part of this whole, like, high time preference behavior, right? Like, because they – a lot of them, at least uh, when I've worked at homeless shelters or whatever, they have some serious alcohol and drug problems, usually. And that's why they're there. They can't, whatever money that they do get, if they were to turn it around, they, they probably could. It's just that they're so addicted to alcohol or whatever that they choose not to and instead get drunk or, you know, like can't help themselves almost. So I don't know how you fix that. Anyway, that was all an aside. I wanted to talk to you, Tatiana, about music. Okay. Of course, you are a very talented musician. So can we go back and can you talk about how you became a musician, like kind of professionally and all that? Yeah. Sure. I like talking about music. I always have to talk about Bitcoin or politics. And I'm burnt out on both of those masks, too. None of that conversation today. So I grew up in Jersey, and as long as I can remember, I always wanted to sing. Mm. And my mom, she used to play a lot of great music for me. My father was a singer, mm. but my mom had much better taste in music. So she would play <laughs> all the 60s and 70s singer-songwriters. Mm. And so I remember listening to, you know, Cat Stevens and thinking, oh, you know, you could use music to convey an idea, mm. and you can cause a revolution. Mm. But my generation did not have a revolution. Little did I know what was in store for me in the future. So, yeah, I went to Berklee College of Music in Boston. And then after that, I started managing a number of different recording studios in Manhattan. So that was cool because they were, you know, the best recording studios. And I got free studio time, which was my whole MO for being there. And then... In 2011, I found out about the Federal Reserve, and I was like, this is the mission I've been looking for. My whole life, I've been dreaming of you, oh, arch enemy of central banking. So yeah, then I got really into Ron Paul, and I got to sing at a lot of different Ron Paul events for thousands of people. So that was really neat, because people would say, oh, you need a niche. And I'm like, what do you want a niche? Like, what am I supposed to like put on a special funny hat or something? And, hey, uh, hey, hey, hey now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that's how I got into more Bitcoin and libertarian stuff. And I don't know, I guess I had to put a little bit of that revolution fire into my music. And I found that path right there. Hmm. So do you feel like that's changed your music or uh, sort of like you as an artist uh, going into this libertarian movement? Like we, you were talking earlier about how your character uh, you feel like is changing. So I mean, has it affected your music, like all this niche that you've decided to go into? Well, I think that my character was just changing from this year being very annoying and my, <laughs> my tolerance for BS is going significantly down. Uh, I mean, I'm eliminating people left and right. <laughs> no, well, you better watch out. This interview could end just like that. <laughs> so, wait, what was the question? <laughs> Has the libertarian stuff uh, affected your music? Yeah. I would say so. I mean, I always was against the man. You know, I was reading 1984. Mm -hmm. I was reading all these dystopian novels. And I had that spirit in my songwriting. Mm -hmm. But to find almost, you know, a like-minded body of people that were receptive to the message, I think, was more like a thumbs up. You're on the right path there, girl. <laughs> and so that definitely has been integrated into my lifestyle you know i don't think that being libertarian is a way to get popular in the music industry <laughs> you know <what> <laughs> contrary <laughs> to popular belief despite their you know tolerance messages they're not so tolerant of different ideas but i think it's it's really important to bring the ideas of freedom and liberty and i don't know sound money to musicians hmm. first of all musicians are super broke hmm. and they're very influential you know people listen to what their musician is singing about and right now I mean, major label music. Are you moved by anything that you hear on the radio? I know that you didn't grow up with secular music. but <laughs> I did sometimes. But the only music that's moved me recently is like the soundtrack to Hamilton. Oh, okay. I didn't listen to that whole thing. <laughs> I did like the Greatest Showman one. Oh. It's like about the circus. Yeah, the Every Time I Lie in Bed. Song. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, one that, that we did for yeah. a Bitcoin <laughs> redo song. Yeah, I like that show, but... I don't know, like, I'm very disappointed with modern music. A friend of mine mentioned, oh, there's no concerts. I'm like, yeah, whatever, who cares? There's nothing going on. <laughs> but I thought about it, and 
brought up a good point that music and going to an actual show together, mm. I mean, you're not like asking the person next to you, who are you voting for? Like, no one cares, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, pass me that joy or whatever right. it is that these crazy kids are getting into. Like nobody's really thinking about those division things. And so this year we've seen even more of that. Like, are we ever going to have a live concert again? Or we just got to sit in bubbles and, you know, have like a meter made, checking that we're a sufficient amount of space from each other. And wearing masks. Yeah, no mosh know. pits, for sure. <laughs> Definitely not. Maybe outdoors concerts. Maybe. What about dirty dancing? They're not going to allow that. <laughs> Clearly not. But, you know, I don't know. I have so many questions based on your answer. But you mentioned that a lot of artists are not very libertarian. Like, is that sort of the personality of the artist, or is it more kind of what the industry kind of expects from you? Why are so many artists, I guess, more liberal, I guess? Okay, so people are getting a very bad education across the board. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with a girlfriend of mine, and, you know, she's a pretty girl, a cute chick. We were thinking about how growing up in school, it was culturally induced or inducted into us whatever mm -hmm. we're indoctrinated into us <laughs> that to be cool well of course you have to be liberal i mean those redneck disgusting <laughs> republican racists i mean that was just completely outside of the realm of even remote possibility as like a consideration mm -hmm. so i think that it's funny because musicians are supposed to be counterculture and they're supposed to kind of be fighting the man mm -hmm. but you know, you take something like Black Lives Matter, which, you know, sure, Black Lives Matter, like, mm -hmm. as, you know, separate. But people are saying, oh, Black Lives Matter, but Nike's behind Black Lives Matter, and Target's <laughs> behind Black Lives Matter, Walmart loves Black Lives Matter. And everybody that's super, super corporate is supporting this rebel thing. And it's not rebellious at all. Mm -hmm. You don't hear any kind of rebellious music. Any kind of rebellious music, I think, was really stifled out because, I don't know, let's say I was a guy in government. And I'm looking at the 60s. I'm not liking what I'm seeing, okay? These imagine all the people. No, no, no. Imagine nothing. Imagine serving my master. You know, that's what they want you to imagine. And I think that music is very out of control. You can't really keep the musical spirit in a box. So I think that, that there's been almost like a cultural Marxism mm. in terms of making artists go into that box. And, yeah, it's highly intolerant. And I mean, this is just like any kind of, I don't mean to completely make fun of liberals, but it's happening today, I guess. <laughs> you know, you can't get through to those people. You can't really, mm -hmm. I don't know, give them a different perspective because they start shrieking. Mm -hmm. And because there's a whole lot of them, you're just outnumbered. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think that that's a cool thing about Bitcoin, though, is because, you know, whenever I would talk to people and say, oh, I'm a libertarian, they would have a conniption. They didn't like that, right? <laughs> but if I can tell them, hey, you like money? Me too. Guess what? Now I have more of it than when I did before. Now, you're not supposed to lure them in with promises of riches, uh -huh. but sometimes that'll lure them in. And also, then you have the opportunity to really discuss, you know, I think like the root of money is kind of how you can tell where all the pieces are rigged in the puzzle, right? We're all looking at the world and we're saying, oh, this is the solution, this is the solution. But if you don't understand how money works, you don't know anything. You're just like a puppet person. You're, you're the kind of person that says, well, we need a $15 minimum wage. <laughs> it's like, well, actually, not really. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, that's only going to help these large corporations. Mm -hmm. And this low-skilled worker is not going to be able to get into the job market. And then the small business owner is going to get screwed and then you're just going to have more Walmarts. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. Like, I think that Bitcoin can maybe be a way for educating artists, but then I'd love to see them go out and spread the good word because the techie guys are not like the gossip <laughs> guys, right? You know, you, you need the musicians to kind of get the word going, make people think it's really cool. So I'm happy the hip hop world has accepted Bitcoin a lot. <laughs> yeah, they do seem to have come up with it. But there's this idea that as you were talking, it reminded me like, Culture is upstream from politics, like politics is almost downstream of it. And how people think about things comes largely from culture and music being an especially portion of it. And it does seem like, uh, you know, because, you know, a certain type of pol like cultural assumptions seem cooler or something like that, mm -hmm. they, there's a tendency for artists to go in that direction, even if they don't really understand all of the downstream effects of what they're producing. How do you educate like artists to do that? Because to me, that's the big thing that's going on right now is that 
there is sort of like a cultural Marxism in a lot of not just like musical artists, but you know Hollywood and all these other places. Uh, and you being one of the few that's actually like more libertarian, how do you, how do you penetrate that? I don't know bubble, I guess. Well, I think that this year a lot of people started questioning the system, so that's good. I mean, okay, I have a controversial theory. I would say that this is scary. Donald Trump has made more people awaken than even Ron Paul, which is, you know, you don't really want them to wake up on that side of the bed 100%, but (laughs) he's getting people to think a little bit differently, right? When you talk to a friend who's really into corona, right, and they're like masked up and they're like, oh, this is for my safety, right? I can give them a lot of different scientific evidence to even consider. And you're not breaking through that wall. And I think that that's a symptom of a larger problem for everybody, right? I mean, people, I mean, I'm extremely wise, so I'm extremely open-minded at all times. (laughs) But I just happen to be right all the time. Now, these other people who are wrong, they just don't even want to hear about it from me. And I'm not sure why they can't just accept, you know, science that I presented them. So, I mean, yeah, musicians, why would they change, right? They want to be loved. They're all like daddy issues, mommy issues. Look at me, look at me. I used to be fat, now I'm skinny. Like whatever crap they're coming up with. And so, yeah, I mean, there is no incentive for them to really go against the grain. The music industry isn't really about authenticity for a long time. Now they're trying to give you packaged authenticity. Like, we want someone off. Can you be authentic? I'd like to see your best authenticity, you know? So I don't know how you can break people's minds unless they're more broadly expanding because otherwise they're just going into that tunnel vision. Well, so you mentioned that the music industry is sort of a certain way. What's wrong with it? What are some of your gripes with the current industry and sort of its practices? How much time do we have? (laughs) Well, we're going to explore after that how Bitcoin fixes it. But, you know, like I want you to, you know, rant as long as you want on this particular topic. Well, I think that, you know, the music industry claims to speak for everybody, right? So you have some people that view Napster as a terrible thing that ruined the music industry. And other people feel like it got them more popular, right? But then you've got the recording association that's saying, oh, we're going to make the rules for everybody. And they're kind of like a cartel, Mm. just like any other kind of business, right? It's a bunch of who you know and who you blow. Mm. And it's sorry for the (laughs) expression, but that's pretty much it, right? You know, like, oh, does my daddy know this person? Like, oh, am I screwing this old guy? And then I guess there's once in a while there's somebody who's original and who cuts through the thing. But I mean, for the most part, what I would like to see happen is a sustainable career for artists without having to compromise their creative I don't know, integrity, right? And so I feel like music died around 96 or 97 (laughs) when Britney Spears came out and she had hit me baby one more time. And I was like, okay, so we're just going like straight up pornos now. Like (laughs) this is cool now. Like we're just like sexualizing underage people. I mean, that was already kind of going on, but that was just it overtly. And then since then, like, I don't even feel like there's any hope for a real artist. So I have a lot of musical friends, right? Mm. And we all want to make an album. And, you know, I'm, I'm making, I just finished my fourth album. So it's getting mixed right now. Extremely nice. exciting. Nice. All seven people are going to listen to it. And maybe <laughs> four of them will buy it. And I'll get you, like. you have it with you? Maybe we could like play something. <laughs> no, it's still getting mixed. But okay. like, I'm kind of joking, but not really. Because let's say an album costs 25 grand to make. And that's like. A good album, but with really good production and done for super cheap, right? Mm. Like, that's like a decent price for a good record. Mm. I mean, how many records am I going to have to sell in order to make my money back? Like, a lot of them. Mm. And I can't even really get my music out there because if the word crypto is mentioned in any of my things, then Facebook won't let me do it. (laughs) So I'm going to spend, let's say, like $100 on Facebook or $1,000 on Facebook ads And then how am I going to make the money back, right? Because then people are going to go to Spotify and I'm going to get 0.0001 penny every time people play. So if I get a million people to listen, I'll get $1,000 back. (laughs) So like something in this economic structure is is a mess. So yeah, I mean, like when I did Tatiana Coin, I mean, everybody's all NFT'd out right now, but I am the OG of this, (laughs) the original Tatiana Coin. So the point there was, 
you know, you're trying to take a little bit of that Patreon model, right? Mm -hmm. Because you want a patron, but Patreon can shut you down. Let's say you are you have a big mouth, like certain people I know. <laughs> you could get shut down at any minute. And, you know, let's say you say something and then PayPal shuts you down. And then all these other people, they basically, you're building up your value. Your whole audience is on their platform, but then they can deplatform you. Or let's say... I was on MySpace and then I went to Facebook. Well, guess what? Nobody's on MySpace anymore. So I lost all those people. And I can't get them into Facebook because then I have to, I don't know, you tell me what I have to do. So I feel like if you have your own artist coin, you can kind of create your own ecosystem of other people. And so as the world evolves, you can just interact with them. And so the other aspect of that would be, okay, so they give me some money. I can raise some money. Now if I get rich, they can maybe also sell their baseball you know, card like Tatiana coins and they'll make millions. Uh, not at all. They definitely won't make any millions ever. If you're listening at the SEC or any other organization, I don't encourage this as a financial instrument. But it is something fun for uh -huh. people to participate in. And more importantly, it gives you a constant source of communication with them. Because now if you have a Tatiana coin, I could send you a message and I could say, hey, Jimmy, what's up? Let's start a revolution. And you're like, I'm not interested in these kinds of messages, miss. I obey. <laughs> so I could be very subversive in that way and no one can really stop me so I think that you know people talk about oh how can Bitcoin save the artists and stuff I mean yeah donate Bitcoin to me that would help <laughs> me a lot you know but other than that I like the idea of creating these networks that nobody can come in between you and the fans I think that that's compelling and sustainable because I don't need to have a million dollars, but I would like to have a hundred thousand a year. And then I would be super rich for like, I don't need much more than that. I could probably even, you know, take a couple vacations. That's plenty of money, you know? And now I can either go to a record label, sell my soul. They don't even put out my record. And they like try and grope me and like any kind of little children that are around, they grab them too. I mean, they're like really sickos over there. So we can avoid all that by going straight into crypto. Well, so the big thing that you seem to be pointing out over and over is that there are lots and lots of trusted third parties here, right? Like the mm -hmm. RA, the record label. Untrusted third yeah, parties. They, yeah, well, you don't want to trust them, but no. if you trust them. Um, and like sort of removing that would help the artists a lot, except there's still this problem of monetizing your music or your creativity or, you know, your album or whatever it is that you have. Uh, so like, what do artists that aren't super famous what do they do do they do live performances How do no they waitress dude uh, uh, that's literally what they do they waitress where are they going to do a live performance right now let me show you let me tell you a little story about live performance okay i can go and get a gig in new york and i remember i got paid like 50 dollars once and i was so excited i was like oh my god i almost covered my gas and tolls i think i'm gonna splurge and get myself a paps blue ribbon right now you know like you're just getting like a ghetto beer and that's like the life right or you can go and learn a bunch of cover songs which most true artists find this to be you know a selling of the soul you can also try and put your music into movies and stuff mm -hmm. so that's another who you know who you blow situation because mm -hmm. everybody wants that gig and now you get paid in exposure which we know how <laughs> the landlord loves exposure payments <laughs> so you know i think that people like to pretend that they're like living this dream but the dream doesn't even exist anymore i was talking with a friend of mine out in la and you know he played with like guns and roses and Demi Lovato, which is a very yeah, <laughs> a random big spread. Contrast there, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, he's doing all these shows and he's more successful than 98% of musicians. Mm. And we're talking and he's like, yeah, I'm just bored. He's like, I don't even know what to do with myself. He's like, yeah, I mean, I produce some tracks and, you know, they get on some mixtapes and then they get some placements and yeah, I made a lot of money, but he just feels completely unfulfilled. Mm. Then I have another artist friend that is just like doesn't even want to write any music right now he's like well what's the point no one's even gonna hear it what's the point of recording an album <laughs> and i'm like yeah pretty much that's true like i'm sorry to tell him that but i completely agree with him like i made my record i hope someone listens to it but i don't expect anybody to listen to it except for maybe six people and it's really depressing because in a normal world, right, you're like a doctor, you're chopping people up, you know, <laughs> filleting that shit. And then people are giving you a big check at the end of it. They're saying, you did a really great job. And then if you're a really good musician, 
it doesn't matter at all. You could be the best musician in the world and you still are going to make $50 for your gig. <laughs> and then, you know, no one's even going to go. And then maybe once in a while, some old horny guy will be like, oh, baby, I remember when I was a kid and like you smoke a cigarette and blow it in your face and tell you how good he thinks you are. Like you're like, oh, like it's not that glamorous <laughs> after a while. I mean, I'm sorry to ruin everybody's dreams of a musical future, <laughs> but it's pretty miserable. And I think... Artists would be happy if they could just make, all right, let's not even say 100 grand a year. If an artist can make 50 to 75K a year, 95% of artists that I know would be perfectly happy with that. Because then they could just make their music. They wouldn't have to sell their soul and, you know, push paper and, like, you know, like circle things and do whatever it is that people do at office jobs, <laughs> you know? And then the world would be a better place because we would be listening to more music and not having to listen to like Lady Gaga at a meat piano <laughs> at the MTV Music Awards and we're all supposed to say, oh my God, that was so good. I've always dreamed of playing at a, a live flesh instrument. <laughs> like, who would want to do that? <laughs> yeah, I agree. There's definitely something off about it, but that points to something that's really odd to me, that there isn't a very big market for music, despite nearly everybody listening to music, right? Like we, you do have these platforms like Spotify where people can listen, but I imagine there's a lot of different things that could use music, like advertisements or, you know, like obviously live shows, you know, restaurants, bars. I mean, there's just so many places that could use music and somehow there's no middle class among artists. What's going on? Like, do they not have a good marketplace? Why don't these people find each other? Uh, you know what? I think that a lot of the people get these kind of blanket licenses through ASCAP and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll tell you a random story. So you've got these, you know, rights associations and they collect money for you and stuff. And so one of these days a friend called me and they're like, hey, I heard your song at the movies. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, I heard your song, Don't Stop Believing. Not the Journey song, the Tatiana song, <laughs> Don't Stop Believing. And and then I started getting random messages from people all over the country saying, yeah, I saw your music at the theater. Mm. So I go and I do, you know, a lot of digging. And it turns out that this company was playing my music, you know, the trivia in between the movies. And they're mm -hmm. like, oh, Harry Potter, uh, yeah. buy a Kit Kat, whatever. <laughs> and so, and then my songs are playing in the background, right? And so... I, I find out that I had, you know, over 10 million plays. Like they did it at like over 500,000 theaters. It was during, you know, Avengers or some kind of big thing. So I'm like, oh, baby, I'm going to make some money. I'm going to make some cash. Nobody asked me to use this. But apparently because of some weird blanket license, after three years and maybe 12 phone calls to ASCAP, I got a check for 200 bucks. What? Yeah. So like, you know... I don't know who's in charge of this, but somebody <laughs> messed up. And because I didn't want to sell my song to 10 million people that nobody ever even bought a record out of. And then and I got 200 bucks out of it. But that's because ASCAP made some deal with some other company. And I'm just some little low level loser on the totem pole. And they don't care what I have to say. I mean, I terrorized them. I complained. It didn't do anything. It was like going to the DMV. <laughs> so, you know, that's the music industry for you. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of people that want to be famous and stuff. Mm. So there's a lot of music that you can license. And also, I don't think people like paying for stuff when they've already gotten it for free. Mm. You know, that's why I think something like a Patreon-esque model is good because then you have the collectible aspect. You know, when you had an album, right? Mm. You had your record and you had your record collection. And it was like all shiny and stuff. And now you don't have anything. You're like, oh, you want to look at my Spotify playlist? Like, nobody cares about that. But if you're a nerd and you want to say, oh, I have the original Tatiana coin, you could have the original 2014 issues of the Tatiana coin. And people would say, holy crap, that's so interesting. And so now you have this finite quality brought into the digital world. And I think that that's compelling. But I don't know if that would motivate me as much. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, then you're kind of depending a little bit on the super fan. And not everybody's lucky enough to have a super fan, but it would be a market improvement over the current situation, which is, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know. I'm going to pay my friend to do a marketing plan for my album now. And I'm like, oh, cool. I get to light some cash on fire. Woo! You know, because I don't even know what mystical thing she could tell me that will make it so my album mm -hmm. just breaks even. <laughs> that would be cool. 
<laughs> so, I mean, and on the one hand, I just started to feel like a little ashamed. I'm like, oh, I should be lying. And she's saying, oh, I'm dropping hits every day and shit, you know, <laughs> popping bottles. But that's not the reality that most artists have. I think a lot of artists feel really disheartened because we just feel like no one cares and no one listens and it doesn't matter. It's like screaming into a forest and no one's hearing you. <laughs> that's so interesting. Music in this weird sort of in-between thing where... Like, if you watch a movie without the music, it doesn't hit any of the emotional notes, right? And if you're watching, like, a slideshow of photos, like, without music, it feels kind of boring. But then as soon as you add music, it's like, oh, my God, this is so amazing. So it's sort of like a portion of that whole emotional experience that people are looking for. But there's not really a great way to monetize it is what I'm hearing from you, is that you're not getting paid for the work that you're doing despite a lot of people making money like somebody is getting in the middle and taking a lot of the value that's what it sounds like yeah i mean i don't know how to solve all those problems right because there's quite a lot of them but it's a matter of you know then you got like spotify guy right <laughs> and so he's got multiple millions of dollars now i think he might be getting close to a billion i don't know the guy's really really rich but that's because he's making 30% or whatever off of everybody that's, well, not him specifically, mm -hmm. but every little wannabe and every little loser that's getting like a penny or two, but he's <laughs> getting all their pennies and he's collecting them all together. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, maybe there need to be other solutions, but I mean, look, I've got me and Adam Levine. We have our Adam B. Levine, not the Maroon 5 guys. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but, you know, we have our music platform and that has you know a streaming component to it and it pays a lot more but if seven people go you know it's not going to be that lucrative and i think it's a hard game because you also have to like when you're signing people up to use your service let's say you're a blockchain thing mm -hmm. like you kind of have to only go forward because getting music that's old mm -hmm. and the licenses are all old and you know you got like seven crusty old people on them so you can't really get them to all uh agree to the terms and stuff so you kind of have to move it going forward mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't think that there's some big solution, but I just want to eat and like have health insurance and, you know, just the normal stuff that people get to, you know, experience. Like a lot of people say, oh, artists are lazy. And that might be true. But I don't know, because most of the artists and I'm lucky because I went to Berkeley and there's some, you know, good students there. Like we just keep working all the time. So artists will go to their day job and then the real work starts at six o'clock. <laughs> In between, you know, they maybe they get to like have some ramen in between, and then they're like, "Oh, good, I saved myself some money. Now I can put it toward my album that no one will ever freaking hear." So they're always working and always hustling. It would be very nice to not have to work twelve jobs and to just be able to do one or two jobs like a normal person. One would be ideal because then you could have like a family and be nice to people in your life instead of just being consumed with your own stuff. Well, so I'm hearing that there's a lot of work that doesn't actually pay off, yet a lot of people do it. I mean, they must really want this in order to go through that much trouble. Well, I feel like, you know, people don't want to give up because they fought everybody in their life and they told them <laughs> that they're going to be a star. And so there's a little bit of pride going on there. And narcissism, maybe? <laughs> maybe, but not even narcissism. It's like... It, you know, narcissism kind of makes fun of it, but I don't think it's really that. I think that a lot of people feel like their purpose on this planet is to is to sing, like I do, you know, in a very serious way. And so when it doesn't matter if you're good or not and just basically nothing that you do makes any difference, you kind of feel like, well, what am I here on this planet for? And so, you know, I have a marketing company and so we do that sometimes and you know, I don't do the bulk of that stuff. But then I think to myself, I can, anyone can be a marketer, but only I can sing my song, my song of my soul. And no one needs listening, you know. So it's very like it's like an existential crisis all the time. And your whole entire identity is sometimes wrapped up in whether or not you're able to achieve that goal. So and is it other people's attention that you're craving from that or is it other people's appreciation what is it exactly? i think it's okay so some people i think that they just like everybody like liking them mm -hmm. but i think that there's almost like a validation for 
okay, so any bad thing that I've ever gone through, right? I'm like, I'll show them <laughs> one day when I'm holding my Grammy and I'm staring to them. It's because of you losers that I'm here. You know, like it's a validation for all the bad things that ever happened, right? You think, well, this will be the part where other people, they hear my inner song, they hear what my soul is going through, and they also feel that same way. And so our misery is in company and therefore is, you know, making everybody feel better because now you feel like a oneness with other human human beings, you know? So sure, there's some ego, but then there's also like a desire to connect with people in order to have like a real meaningful engagement with life itself. Yeah, there's a definite emotional component, definitely for the listener, but it sounds like for the artist as well, there's sort of like an emotional connection that you get with your fans as well. Totally. So that brings me to the horror that is known as the Zoom concert. <laughs> I want to kill myself. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about a Zoom concert. Okay, so, you know, I'm singing and I'm used to people not necessarily paying attention. So, you know, that's fine. And so I'm doing a Zoom concert for my friend and all of a sudden I got Zoom bombed. And so the first Zoom bombing was of something that you don't want to see. <laughs> something that you definitely will see in your mind for a long time afterward that you never thought, it never even occurred to you to look at something like this or to even imagine that this goes on. And so, you know, and then I'm like, okay, you know, I stopped playing and I'm like, okay. So then the next song comes on and now I see another really creative adult film <laughs> and like very very international and like a lot of different kinds of features and and so you know i had to keep playing and stuff and at the time i thought it was funny uh -huh. but then later on i was appalled and i felt really pressed and like oh my god like am i just this is what i'm worth like looking at buttholes like i don't want to do that <laughs> like why is my life just so meaningless and so I miss being able to perform in front of a few people and you're not going to replace that. Like F the Zoom conference call, F all the conferences like that are online, <laughs> except for La BitConf and a couple others that are cool. But otherwise, like I feel like it's completely unfulfilling. I just want to see people. I want to ignore them for 10 minutes after I go off the stage so I can compose myself. I want all the things that you get from going to a live show and then you get to hang out with everybody and drink and be like, ah, <laughs> you know, water or, or, you know, coconut water, or whatever you want. But I'm just saying like, it's, it's just totally different and I hate performing at home and I really don't want to do it. <laughs> but there is a component of that performance that's fulfilling for you that you almost can't do without is what it sounds like. Yeah, I think so. I think that's like, you know, there was different periods of time where I was getting paid for my performances and stuff. And when times are thin, those kind of like fade away. And sometimes, you know, you get paid and stuff and that's cool. And I prefer to do the ones where they're paying. But now, I mean, if I could just do even an open mic and it's just for real people, I'll do it for the pleasure. It's not like before where it's, you know, you're doing it because you need the money or something. I mean, that $50, <laughs> it really takes you a really far, far away. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I miss just seeing people. Mm. And I feel like there's become, like, people are very classist now. They're like, well, I don't know where you've been, you know? <laughs> and it's almost a way of being kind of, like, snobby toward other people. Mm. And I found that some people who don't like my radical views mm. – they're like, oh, well, I don't know where you've been and what your friends do. I'm like, we all like lick doorknobs and like <laughs> toilet bowls and we just rub our faces in them. Like, what do you think we're doing? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, times are tough in 2020. Yeah, I could tell. All right, so let's explore like how Bitcoin changes things because I do think that the main problem that I'm getting from you about the music industry <laughs> is that there are a lot of trusted third parties or gatekeepers or people that essentially determine other people's success instead of the free market. So the obvious question is, how do you bring music to the free market in a way that's not so dependent on these third parties, I guess? I don't know. I don't even know where people get new music from. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I know that they have playlists and stuff mm. and... I like the radio, even though the radio offers me exactly nothing now. I mean, it's completely worthless. But I like the idea of curation. So I don't think that people are really getting that anymore. 
Well, have you considered being like a music curator and like just... I'm going to play music from like the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. I'm not going to play <laughs> anything from 2000 onward. There will be nothing at all. Well, that might be a way in which... Like, because good musical curation is actually quite difficult. And I feel like not too many people know how to do it. it and I almost feel like musicians would be able to identify sort of certain emotional traits that you can then send to other people. So instead of like these record labels being that trusted third party or Spotify algorithms or whatever, it could be actual people that are like, hey, you know what, you should listen to this. This might change your mind on this. Or, you know, there might be sort of like more civic minded <laughs> listener that wants like messages that go beyond whatever. There might be completely you know, like I use music to escape, right? Like they want something that makes them feel a certain way. And curating that and figuring that out, well, you'd have to listen to a lot more music in order to make that happen. So, yeah. so what we did was, this is an initial, but there was this thing called like blip.fm that I really liked. Mm. And it was one of the only ones of these weird new music things that I liked. And all it was, was I would just be a DJ. And I would just pick out songs that I liked. Uh -huh. And then I would go to somebody else's thing. And if I liked their song, I would add it to my playlist. Mm -hmm. And I just had my own playlist. And I loved it because I like making, you know, mm -hmm. what do you call those mixtapes and stuff mm -hmm. like back in the day. So something that we did was in our streaming platform, like if you're a power playlist maker, mm -hmm. you actually get paid for doing that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's kind of a fun thing because mm -hmm. it can incentivize the average music person in order to participate. And if they're generating more listens for my music, mm -hmm. like let's say you're like a playlist creator and you <laughs> just have all ta-ta all the time, you know, you obviously have really great taste. So now you're generating more people to listen to your network and then they're listening to me and now you're getting a little chunk of something, right? Mm -hmm. And that's cool because now – it's not necessarily, you know, the radio station that's mm -hmm. getting that kind of benefit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's definitely something missing in the music experience these days. Like, I like listening from other people. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I just won't listen to anything. I'll just listen to old... I bought a boombox that has a tape player and a <laughs> CD player, and I'm pleased as punch <laughs> because that's really just the way that I like it. Mm -hmm. You know, I miss the concept of an album. Now it's just like, oh, it's a single... <laughs> No WAP, like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah, that's not exactly the, the kind of theme that I'm looking for, right? Yeah. Very and the cool. album is more, it's like a statement. It's almost like a book versus just a single song that's just there to kind of lure yeah, you or, in. Or like a whole symphony or something like that, right? Like, you know, going to a concert and hearing from beginning to end instead of a single song over and over, which is sort of our tendency. To yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, think about, like, if you go to a club and stuff, music is so bad in the club. Like, they have to listen to, like, techno or some kind of, like, oons, oons thing. And I can get down with some of that stuff. But for the mm -hmm. most part, I mean, I feel like we're missing out on the disco days of ABBA. Mm -hmm. Think about the great songwriting of ABBA. And that was popular music. And that was danceable music. And now our dance music is just... <laughs> like come on you know i want something a little bit better and then you look at you know you used to have james brown right and that was dance music and that was so good and then you had stevie wonder and he was danceable and he was really good and now apparently just sorry no more we can't have any more good music that's it we're out of ideas guys to be fair, do you feel like there is good music, maybe even among your friends or something like that? that oh, yeah. There has to be good music yeah. out there. The world is filled with billions of people. I'm sure that one or two of them came up with a couple good songs. <laughs> but somehow you're not getting to discover them. Exactly. And somehow the ones that are good never even get jobs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I know a few different girls that I went to school with at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and they were just fantastic artists, like really, really great and they just never ended up doing music after that. Their parents spent, you know, a couple hundred grand on the Perfect. best music school <laughs> in the country. You get to make $10 an hour every hour when you get out of here, if you're lucky. <laughs> like, it's a completely worthless kind of thing, right? And now, so Berkeley, when I went, it was only about 100 grand for all four years, mm -hmm. which was a lot of money. Yeah. Now it's $300,000 <laughs> to go to Berkeley. Like, screw you jerks. What are you kidding me? <laughs> this is, you know, the best music school in the country. And you literally 
will not make more than ten dollars an hour for the first ten years <laughs> after you're graduated. Like after your dreams have been crushed and your hopes, then you're you know, when I was in school, people just started using music and advertising. Mm. And I remember talking to my friend thinking, Oh, that's disgusting. I would never have my music in an ad. Now I'm like, yo, yo, can I get in on that Pepsi Cola? Like, what's up? Like, I want to sell some like Viagra products. I heard that sells really well. I mean, like, the, the standard for artistic integrity has gone down significantly in this time. Well, it's, it's actually listening to the market and, you know, your dreams of like making it, making esoteric music that 30 people listen to just doesn't work but no see this is where i would counter i don't think that it's just like random music that nobody could listen to yeah. like if you listen to my music mm -hmm. not that it's like the great greatest music ever we all have to aspire to this but <laughs> like generally it's good music the songs are well written mm -hmm. the artist is like pleasant i don't look like a murderer you know grandma's <laughs> gonna like it little children are gonna dig it you know it's a chick with a guitar like there's nothing unappealing about that mm -hmm. but it's like all the soul has been crushed out of the popular music world. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't listen. I think Lady Gaga is a very talented artist. Mm -hmm. I feel nothing, mm -hmm. zero when she sings at all. Like, I feel nothing. I don't understand who's feeling anything listening to these people. And I think that they've been dumbed down. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just are eating McDonald's all the time, you're going to think McDonald's is pretty good. <laughs> but really, when you go to Ruth Chris, you're like, oh, man, this is so good. And then you're going to go to another steakhouse and go like, oh, my God, this is even better than Ruth Chris. <laughs> Most people are just eating McDonald's or not even McDonald's, like Arby's, you know, something <laughs> even more subpar, like a Burger King, you know. And so I think that people need to start tasting steaks again, and then they're not going to be interested in this nasty fast food. Yeah, possibly. But there's so little that we know about, like, people's... I don't know, musical, there isn't as much of a musical marketplace for the consumer, right? Like there's very little paths to discovery. And but maybe we're old and we just don't look at that because that's mm. possible. Mm. Like I'm not going around thinking, hey, I want to listen to some new music. What do I do? <laughs> you know, and if I've ever gone to YouTube and I'll click on music and then I get Ariana Grande and other prostitutes, I mean musicians <laughs> that are very talented. I mean, literally that's all it is. And then... And then there's a chick that looks like she's going to be country, but then she's got a whole bunch of auto tune. Uh -huh. And then that's kind of a turn off. Mm. I don't know. I think it's on purpose. Why would they want people to feel anything? <laughs> they don't want that, right? I mean, think about it. Our whole entire society is like now, oh, everybody's all excited. Oh, marijuana is going to be legal. And normally, yeah, I'd be like, yeah, marijuana is going to be legal. But really, basically, they're just allowing people to dumb themselves down even further. Mm. I don't think that they want people to be thinking that much. Marijuana can make you, you know, can accelerate your thinking, but it can also really slow you down. Mm. Alcohol, like, okay, a couple of glasses of wine here and there, woohoo. But for the most part, it's not exactly doing you any favors. <laughs> so I think that, like, our education system, right, mm. the food that we eat, the drugs that are in the water or whatever, I mean, mm. you can take that whole thing, <laughs> like, pretty far. But for the most part, I don't think that people are encouraged to feel anything. They're encouraged to be consumptive. Mm. You know, hate themselves and they look in the mirror and just buy and feed at the trough and then, you know, bring in the bacon so they could become bacon or something. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I think what you're arguing is that most of the music out there is is used for consumption or for getting people to buy products or something like that or to sort of dull their sold to the misery that is their life or something something to that effect yeah i would say maybe that's the deal i mean i don't know i'm kind of speaking from my own perspective right mm -hmm. but last i checked generally people are not into war right mm -hmm. not a very popular thing people are like oh man i can't wait to blow up some kids around the world that's gonna be really good like people don't like that but have you heard a single anti-war song in 20 years we've been at war for over 20 years now and you don't hear a single anti-war song. Why? You would have the Not Ready to Make Nice song, which got the Dixie Chicks in a lot of trouble because they basically said, like, F you to, like, George Bush or whatever. But that was acceptable because he's a Republican, so you're allowed to hate him. <laughs> but for the most part, you don't hear anything. But back in the 60s and the 70s, you had a whole bunch of songs that were pushing back against the system. So they're like, oh, no, we can't have that going on, you know? So I think that there's a yearning in the soul of people, but they don't even know that they're yearning for it yet. Yeah, they don't. They, like, consumers it's like, are not good at identifying what it is that they need or want. 
No, so maybe it's like that Soma attitude, you know, like Brave New World, where they're yeah. just taking something and make themselves feel better, and so they don't have to really think about anything. It's like we're living in a world of people on ecstasy, where they're just like, I want to feel good, yeah, <laughs> yum, 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 you know, like, and you even look at like people's reaction to Corona. They don't want to die. And I'm like, well, first of all, you're not even living. <laughs> Second of all, like, who the hell told you that you're going to have a life without any kind of danger? Mm. Guess what? You might die. Mm. Everybody's going to die. <laughs> like, sorry to break it to you. But they're just, you know, the idea of discomfort is very intolerable for people. And I think one of the really good things about this year is being forced to not go anywhere, you know? Because I do the same thing. I can think of lots of different ways to distract myself. In fact, I've been doing it lately. I've been eating a lot of junk food this past week, like a candy monster. But, you know, I think that it's almost like a little bit of like a Buddhist adjustment in thinking of, you know, every moment is valuable, even if it's a bad moment. And just because you're in a moment of discomfort or something, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's something bad because you can look at it in a positive way, you know what I mean? And be grateful for that, for that discomfort because it teaches you something that maybe you wouldn't see if you were just happy. Yeah, I, I think you're right. There is sort of like a forced reflection as a result of this lockdown that maybe yeah. people are kind of having to go through. They're fighting it. I think people are, I mean, how long do you think this is going to go on? Because I think we got another year and a half of this. Are you serious? Come I on. think so, yeah. I'm very concerned. I think that we're going to just see a bunch of this. I mean, if I were an evil overlord, I would be rubbing my hands together with delight. <laughs> I would be so thrilled. This is my perfect thing. Because everybody hates each other. Everybody's fighting each other. They don't like their neighbor because their neighbor has got the wrong team. Mm logo you know this is juicy stuff i wouldn't give away that power if i were them and now you could tell everybody you could probably even tell yourself oh it's for the people because they need my help and i need to be a leader and keep them safe <laughs> i mean we've got this guy governor murphy in jersey right and i interviewed this guy ian smith from the attila's gym and governor murphy told attila's gym you can't open your gym and they said f you governor <laughs> and so they opened up their gym and they've had over 55,000 visits, zero cases of COVID, zero. Uh -huh. And they are now being fined over $300,000. And it's going to probably hit half a million by the end of the year. Oh, my goodness. Just for opening up their business. I mean, is that guy just straight up thinking, I hate that guy, and he's got a bigger dick than me. Like, I have to fight him. Like, or is it, sorry for this family-friendly show, uh, a little too late for that. But, you know, or is he thinking to himself, well, I'm protecting the people of New Jersey from this school again and his weight training routines. You know, we can't have any of that. I don't know. Some of them are evil overlords. Some of them are just useful idiots. I mean, I think we're screwed, though. They're not going to give back the power. Yeah, there's an authoritarian streak that's coming out in so many people right now. That... But nobody's fighting it. People are yeah. just going along with it. They're just okay with it because it'll keep them safe. And F them and their safety. <laughs> you know, seriously, it's kind of like, like it's almost, almost like an, I don't like to make fun of Americans being entitled. But if there was ever a time to say like an American entitlement attitude, you know, <laughs> like, oh, I don't want my chi to be disturbed or like whatever kind of like bullshit, like, oh, I'm taking over this method of peace from this <laughs> region. I mean, people are just completely out to lunch. They need to wake up. Hmm and appreciate why they're here, myself included. I think that I could be, you know, wrapped up in my own world and then I'll hear about different kinds of lockdowns and things like that and I say, hey, stop messing around with that candy over there. You better write a song for a revolution. And I'm like, but no, listen, too bad, just write it anyway. You know, there's that internal dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting because I do feel like a lot of people are oppressed and like a lot of my friends that don't have Bitcoin in their life, you know, they're like seriously depressed. They're like, what the hell? Like what's going to happen? They're either scared to death or kind of depressed the other way because there's so much authoritarianism. When the heck am I allowed to go out? And no one's like rebelling. So I feel like completely alone, that sort of thing. And that's where I think Bitcoin has like a role is because Bitcoin is the revolution and it is the way in which we can opt out of the system and hopefully take this insane amount of power that the state has and start taking back some of it. But what do you think about like, okay, so if I buy my Bitcoin on Coinbase, mm. now the evil overlords will know that I have Bitcoin. <laughs> and until 
that tragic day with that horrible boating accident. <laughs> They're going to be able to take that from me at any time, right? I mean, not really, but I don't know. Do you think that the government is going to keep letting us rock with this whole revolution money? Because there's a lot of institutional money going into Bitcoin now. There's all these creepers that are, you know, looking at every single transaction and finding out what little underwear drawer people have got their Bitcoin stuck into. <laughs> Is it really still the people's currency? Like, is it still our answer? Is it the revolution still? I would hope so. I, would I hope, hope so, so, too. But I think that our stats should have been worth a little bit more by now. Well, I mean, it, it's worth a lot right now. I mean, that's in the past couple of weeks. I feel like we should be at 100K of Bitcoin by now or something better than 13 and a half, you know? I mean, I, I mean, it's coming. I, I think, think it's coming, too. But I guess I thought... All things considered that have gone on, mm -hmm. didn't you think we would be a little bit, you know, richer by now? I thought so. Especially like maybe 12 months ago, I was mm -hmm. thinking that by now we would be in a full raging bull market. It's not the case. We're in a bull market, but not quite at the levels that I anticipated. But at the same time, I mean, it's way better than everything else. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's still cool. But I mean, I'm just saying, like, I don't have a Lambo yet. And I'm just wondering when Lambo. No, this is a great time to stack sats. That's how I comfort myself when I think about how rich I could be. <laughs> then I think about I could be even more rich if I just don't buy yeah. this expensive coffee thing or like another kitchen appliance I absolutely have to have by the next day. Yeah, it does teach you low time preference behavior, right? Like that is sort of like... You know, planning for the future. Yeah, we're like old people now. Yeah, well, how would that change music? Because I think you mentioned earlier that a lot of musicians are actually very high time preference, and except with their music, which is, which is interesting, because you know they they plan for that studio time and you know however much money it takes to put out an album, and they work like hell to get towards it. But in like lots of other areas of their lives, they're not planning much at all. Yeah, I don't know if that's just musicians. I think people don't really think... Like, that's why I was making fun of us and saying we're like old people. Like, saving isn't very fashionable. Saving isn't even very lucrative because you don't make any money if you put your money into a savings account. Uh, yeah, if you put it in fiat money, definitely. Well, yeah, fiat money is just dirty and gross. <laughs> has no value in this world. Give it all to me in the meantime. <laughs> yeah, but that low time preference behavior, it's got to change... The way artists look at music, because in a sense, like so many of them seem to be trying to, quote unquote, make it. But if you're planning for the long term, I bet you there are better strategies to get where you want to go. Like even if it means like working five years, not as a waitress, but, you know, like in some marketing department, but sort of like. But it's a young person's game. That's the other thing, right? Like I remember being 22 and thinking I'm all washed up. It's <laughs> over. No one wants me because I'm not a f fresh 15 year old, you know? So when you're that age, you don't think of that stuff. Like my parents suggested, oh, you should get a regular job and then mm -hmm. pay for your music. And I wanted a cool job that was in the music industry, which of course paid $15 an hour, which is a big <laughs> improvement over 10. <laughs> so, you know, you just don't think of it that way. You think optimistically. It's almost like when you're young and you get a credit card mm. and you think, oh, well, I'll pay this back, no problem. <laughs> well, because if I'm making $30,000 a year, I mean, I'm going to have plenty of money left over. This is nothing. <laughs> you know, you just don't think of it that way. Mm. The main thing that I have done that has been the best thing that I've done for any kind of musician friend mm. is give them Bitcoin. Mm. Literally, that's the best thing I've ever done for any of them. Mm. My engineer from my second album, Love and Liberty, I paid him... One of my records, I paid him, I don't remember what it was, but it was probably like around five grand, right, uh -huh. in USD. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin was, I think, like, I don't know, 200 or 500 bucks uh -huh. at that time. <laughs> so anyway, point is, is that now the math might be a little bit wrong on this. So nerds, slow your roll, maybe. <laughs> all right. Point is, is the guy made over 100 grand in, uh -huh. in, in, for me because uh -huh. I paid him in Bitcoin. Uh -huh. And he actually listened to me, unlike most people <laughs> who don't listen to me at all. So... Yeah, I basically bought him, you know, like a down payment on a condo easily mm. just because I paid him in Bitcoin. Nice. So I don't know, like, I don't think that we're going to teach everybody about Austrian economics. <laughs> but if you give them a little bit of Bitcoin and, you know, I gave my friend for her something or other, a hundred bucks, and now it's worth 1500. And I'm oh. like, yeah, I'm your best friend, aren't I? And she's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, you are. 
And my brother, he's a financial advisor. And I'm like, I don't think your advice is that good because <laughs> my investment was, uh, you know, 100x or whatever. So, yeah, what you pointed out earlier that it's a young person's game, that's largely because of the gatekeepers, right? Like, mm. like to me, like a more mature artist is a lot easier to listen to because they know their art. They're much more in tune with the sound that they make. They know where they want to take the audience. They know all the little tricks. They just have more experience. And I mean, classical music, if you look at that, it didn't make anything good until they were like 35 or something at least. So would that change a little bit? With... But uh, they're not selling music, though. Mm. They're selling an aesthetic. Yeah. And no offense, 35-year-olds, <laughs> but you all looked a lot better when you were 25. I mean, that's just the way it goes, right? So... Mm. You know, you look at an artist like Van Morrison, right? Van Morrison was not a good-looking man. Mm -hmm. But Van Morrison made so many songs that we all really, really love. Now that once in a while, they'll throw you, like, one fat chick. And they'll be like, oh, look, see, we don't care about looks. And then, like, two years later, she loses 80 pounds. And, you know, and now she's just, like, hot and slutty like the rest of them. So, you know, but that's kind of the thing, right? Like, they don't have any – once in a while, they'll give you an ugly guy. You know, like, what's that, CeeLo Green? I mean, he's a fantastic guy, but he's not, like, you know, winning any beauty contests or whatever. <laughs> and then, and so the, they'll let you have that. But, I mean, music is, like, porno now. You can't be a really good, like, they just make even a plain Jane. They're like, oh, well, we need to make you look like something. I don't know what, but something. And now, I mean, now they just try and make you look like a demon. That's a cool <laughs> thing. Like this, what's her name, Billie Eilish? She's a good artist, I guess. But her songs are very, like, the lyrical content is disturbing to me and not really very good. And then she dresses in big bags and, you know, like, really, really baggy clothes. But you know that what's going to happen. It's only a matter of time until she's dressed, like, naked because that's what they're going to do. Like, oh, this one, we know how we're going to trick them. Before we make her into a super slut, we're going to put her into, like, really, really big baggy clothes. And that's really going to titillate people because they're going to wonder what's underneath that big Stay Puft Marshmallow Man costume that she's wearing, you know? And so that's how I feel like it is. And it sucks because if you want to, like, I'm not a prude person, but I find myself becoming like an old crotchety Christian lady <laughs> because it's like put on some clothes, girls, because, I mean, I don't know. I talked about this maybe a month or so ago, but I was reflecting on, on the influence that Madonna had on me, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like 13 or 14. My parents were getting a divorce, and all I wanted to be was a slut. Like, why the effing hell? Did I, normal girl, like normal middle class, normal, like nothing in like a bad way one way or the other. Like why did it occur to me that the best thing that I could aspire to in my high school days was being a slut? Like all joking aside, that's not a good healthy mental state for little girls. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. It's because I liked Madonna. Mm -hmm. And Madonna was an uber whore. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to be because look at Madonna. Who wouldn't want to be like her? She was super hot. Mm -hmm. And I think that now – You've got all these little girls, like you have a family. I don't know how old your children are, but I would really not want, if I had a 13-year-old girl, for her to listen to Rihanna or, or Britney Spears or Ariana Grande or, or the other little suicide chick. Like all these girls are miserable and they either look like prostitutes or they look like devil worshipers. Mm. And I just don't think that that's healthy, mm. you know? And I'm sorry, I feel bad for 13-year-old me that was looking for some kind of outside you know, I'm glad that I had other female artists to influence me. You know, I had Fiona Apple. I had the Indigo Girls. I had Tori Amos. I had Alanis Morissette. And those were, I think, more positive role models. But what do little girls listen to right now? I mean, they get Taylor Swift, who, you know, just starts fights with people. And, I mean, I like Taylor Swift. She's fine. But all she writes is revenge songs for <laughs> boyfriends, which, I mean, trust me, I'm really good at the revenge song for boyfriends. <laughs> but, I mean, that's literally, there's no, I don't know. Like, it's just... Like, girls are taught to be really hypersexualized, but you don't need a man, but you better dress like you want one. <laughs> like, like, it's just very, very confusing, and I don't think that that's healthy, and I'm saddened by it because I miss music that filled my soul. Like, Janis Joplin wasn't trying to look slutty. Mm. She was just being cool and singing about, you know, <laughs> living's just another word or whatever it is. Uh, freedom's just another word. Like, she was just singing, like, stuff from the heart, and you don't get that anymore. Mm. You only yeah. get contrived faces with like a lot of like sticks in them and stuff like you gotta put all the all the potions in your face <laughs> yeah it is sort of like selling something else and i think that's a really keen insight there The it's not really about the music but sort of the lifestyle behind it and that's what you get influenced by and that's 
kind of what music is now. It's not really selling music. It's selling an aesthetic. It's selling a lifestyle. It's selling a belief system almost, which is kind of disturbing. When can we get back to just music? What can we do? I don't know if we're ever going to be able to. I mean, if you think about most pop music, it doesn't even matter who's singing it. Mm. It's like insert slutty girl here. Mm. Any hot girl would do because you don't hear their voice. Mm. It's they use all the all the stuff on top of the voice. It's like, oh, don't you do me see? Don't you do me see? Oh, look at me. See, look at that. I could have been Britney Spears. I missed my effing calling. If only I had been willing to dress up in a plaid skirt on other days besides Halloween, I could have had a feature. <laughs> there is something about that. I don't know. Why don't they decouple music from culture? I, that to me is a little bit confusing because music is is important in a lot of other areas like and it's almost like integral to like movies for example like musical score is a significant part of a film you know advertisement certainly like just almost anything that you hear has some musical component to it so why isn't that decoupled it's almost like there's this i mean obviously it gets made but there's a portion that's sort of like very cultural like the culture gods. But it's a propaganda piece. That's what it is, yeah. right? They don't want people to be doing anything other than consuming and just all the wonderful features <laughs> that I described earlier from the current music business that they have to offer, right? Mm. I don't know. I mean, and also think about it right now if Corona is going on mm. and all these music venues are closing down, mm. where are those people going to get work from? I mean, the restaurants are closed. All these musicians <laughs> are going to be starving in the streets. Mm. Maybe they need to do podcasts. I don't know. Well, that's the thing, right? So they can start putting their music into a podcast. And then, I mean, I don't know. Like, all right. So I paid this musician the other day, right? And and my friend's like, all right, it's going to be $350 for the day. And I'm like, $350? That's a lot of money. I'm like, what do you mean $350? But then I thought about it. I'm like, okay, wait. So this person's going to be here for 10 hours. All right, 35 bucks an hour isn't that bad. And then you start thinking, well... They also spent, you know, 30 years of their life learning this instrument. <laughs> so then you're like, okay, fine. And now, like, all that, all those people that were musicians that were making money in all these other places are now all just going to be making podcast music. <laughs> so you're going to have a really good selection. But, like, I don't know. Maybe there's just too many people that are making music and not enough monetization opportunities. Like, if people don't want to pay for it, I don't yeah. know. Right. I don't think I'm going to start wanting to pay for music if I've been getting it for free for a while. That's a hard sell. Even for this podcast, like the intro and outro music, I bought for like 40 bucks, right? Like on some creative thing. And I was like, okay, I'll just buy this. I guess I have the rights now and I can mix it into my podcast. Versus, I guess, getting actual musicians and having them, I don't know, compose something. But at least somebody got paid for the $40 thing that you paid. Yeah, like, I mean, let's think about that, middle, right? Who knows how many middlemen there are, right? Right. So what did that person make? If they made $40, right? So it probably took them like three hours to make it mm -hmm. and then an hour to upload it and maybe like look up what the website does and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, so they made what, $10 an hour for that <laughs> at most? And that's like a really good, you know, I don't know. Like, how are you supposed to raise a family or do anything useful with that? Yeah, I feel like it has to be kind of like a hobby or something that you do like very... It has to be extremely low time preference is what I'm getting out of this conversation. Music, by its very nature, is a very hard and long road. And if you're not willing to play for the long term, or, you know, if I guess you can like try to get in via the front door of the music industry, but that seems like not a path for most people. It has to be this very long and planned, like, thing where you're you know sort of constantly improving your art so you can get to the place where you can do it no but see that's the thing constantly improving your art is not a requirement that's the problem it would be one thing if like you got better at your art and then you would get more money mm. it doesn't always work in that way yeah. you know and i think that that's what makes it so miserable oh and like there's no payoff for improving exactly yeah and then also you know think about it like if you're a musician and then every time that there is okay, well, Friday nights and Saturday nights, you're not available because you're on <laughs> tour. And I don't know. It's a very unglamorous job. Mm. Like when I was in college, I used to think, oh, I want to date musicians. Now I'm like, oh, get that guy out of here. 
I'm like, take your little tambourine and beat it, mister. <laughs> or your triangle. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to hear it, Ringo. <laughs> uh, all right, so question that I ask every guest is, where do you see Bitcoin and music, that's the topic, in 20 years? Where do you see it? I... I would like for what I've envisioned to happen, which is to basically help bring blockchain to artists mm. in a way where they can actually have a sustainable career. Well, I don't I, care about do them you mean being blockchain or just sort of like their own, more control over their stuff and not getting middlemaned on everything. Well, I think blockchain is an answer for that. Don't you think so? Why Why don't you like that? You're making a face. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm not so sure about this whole blockchain uh, thing. Uh, yeah, no, I, but, I, I don't. Because like, if you're an artist, you can just sell directly to the public. It's a matter of distribution and figuring that out. I don't know if blockchain necessarily. Adds. Well, wouldn't you need the blockchain in order to make your chain to your fans unbreakable, right? Like that's something that's you like could, something that you can do that, that, that with can... signatures. You, there, there are lots of different ways to do it without a blockchain. And that's yeah, I, I don't think a blockchain adds anything. If you want communication with your fans, that I mean, artists do that already. I mean, like you, you but maybe I can't that. do that because Twitter doesn't like what I have to say, and so now they take away all my fans and stuff. Yeah, well, if so, if you what have an the email only list, method the email list is the only thing that can be mm -hmm. um, pure, right? And that's kind of like the holy grail of the contact with the fan because mm -hmm. the email list follows them around. Mm -hmm. But theoretically, emails can close down. I don't know. I mean. I think a blockchain, like, I think a Tatiana coin model would be great. I want my little fans, and we're all connected <laughs> in our own little world, and nobody can take it away from us. Yeah, well, you could do that with the email. You can probably But what if something. Gmail shuts me down? They say, oh, no, Tatiana. Yeah, you have to run your own mail server. But it, right. That way. That doesn't sound as fun. <laughs> like, a Tatiana coin sounds way more fun. Hold on. Let me crash you into my mail server, guys. <laughs> like, tatamail.com. Right, we'll name it something like Saber or something. Yeah, call, call it something more Okay, fun. Saber is cool. Yeah. <laughs> It yeah. sounds very, you know, like tiger-like. <laughs> I've been really into Cobra Kai lately. I feel like it's really influenced my music. Um, I wrote a song for my album. There's this chick, and she was all crazy and stuff. And so I say, you know, you can't fight crazy. That's the name of the song, right? Because you can't. And then in it, I say, you know, you know, <laughs> I don't want to start a street fight, but I'm coming for you. <laughs> and it's because of Cobra Kai. So I think everybody needs a little bit of that energy. Did you see that? I haven't watched it. Holy cannoli. Listen, <laughs> Cobra Kai is life, okay? It was so important to me to see it and feel my inner karate person. I like that show. It's oh. good. It's got a little bit of fight to it. You know, not everything has to be... Like, I feel like everything's very watery lately. I, I like a little bit of, like, spicy fighting going on. And how did you rate the score uh, around that show? Oh, that show has great music. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's very 80s throwback. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's a really good show. You wouldn't think so. But I liked the idea of having a street fight. Mm. You know, it made me a little aggressive. And sometimes we need that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, okay, so where can people find you? Oh, I'm on the internet, unfortunately. <laughs> That's the only place that you're allowed to find me. I'll be in my cage in New Jersey <laughs> for my own good. Yeah, people can go to TatianaMoreau's.com. They can go to the TatianaShow.com and listen to some interviews. They can go to Proof of Love Cast, <laughs> where you and I discussed low time preference and dating. That's right. You yeah. had a whole like analysis over there. We got to do another one of those. That was fun. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for being here, and we'll have to do this again. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Bitcoin Fixes This. Tatiana can be found at at Queen Tatiana on Twitter and on TatianaMoroz.com. Until next time, Fiat Belinda Est.